Oh, welcome to this, our 70th show on Palestine Deep Dive. Quite a remarkable milestone. And today, to mark that milestone, I'm joined by Richard Burden. Uh, and Richard is a veteran campaigner for the rights of Palestinians. He's a trustee of the Balfour Project, and I, I hope we might have some time to talk about uh, that as we as we go on, uh, to find out a bit more about what it's doing, what it's set out to do. And I hope also that we might talk about uh, its work. Um, and I also would like to mention that Richard is, of course, the vice chair of Labour Friends of Palestine in the Middle East. He's a former chair of the All Party Britain and Palestine group, of which more later. And of course, he's the former Labour MP for Birmingham Northfield in the Midlands in Britain. And he has also been a shadow minister for transport. So look, I know that uh, you're all joining us from different parts of the world. Please uh, do send in your questions. Uh, Richard will be happy to uh, answer them. Um, let us know who you are and uh, where you're getting in touch from. And Richard's kindly ag agreed to be with us for uh, for all of this programme, perhaps 45, 50 minutes. And I'd like to just begin um, to say, uh, Richard, that a, a number of people have actually been in touch with us to say that it's it's a pity that your voice isn't being heard in Parliament anymore. Um, I, you you uh, were, of course, a very active parliamentarian until the last general election. Um, you were 27 years, we were just talking about this before the show started, um, the Labour member for Birmingham Northfield. And for those who don't know it, Birmingham Northfield was, of course, home to the Longbridge uh, uh, Auto Works, the former British Leyland plant, a huge manufacturing hub. Uh, and, of course, you were very, very active in trying to save that plant from closure. Um, I remember covering it as a story at the time, as it as it happens, but, but there we are. Uh, and then thinking about it... Um, it's it's not just that that your voice isn't really being heard in Parliament, but increasingly you do begin to wonder where those voices for Palestine are in Parliament. And I suppose that is the question to begin with, Richard. I mean, it does seem at the moment that um, there don't seem to be many voices speaking out strongly uh, for, on the issue of Palestine. And there's always a risk that if they do, um, the they get pushed back. So um, what's what's the recipe? What's the recipe? What's what's going wrong? Well, thanks, Mark. And hello to you and hello to everybody watching and contributing tonight. And happy 70th birthday to Palestine. Deep dive. Um, and particular thanks to those people who sent in science, those kind comments about my work on Palestine over the years. Um, there are still people in Parliament who speak up for Palestine. Just to give you a few examples, on the Labour side, there's people like Andy Slaughter, the Hammersmith, Hammersmith MP. There's Julie Elliott from the North East, who's very active on it, um, Naz Shah. So there are a range of Labour MPs. On the uh, 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 on the other opposition parties, there's Leila Moran, who is herself of Palestinian descent, Liberal Democrat, Tommy Shepherd, and others in the Scottish National Party. And even though a lot weaker voices or a lot fewer voices on the Tory side. They do exist, people like Flick Drummond, Crispin Blunt, and of course in the House of Lords, um, Saeed Awasi. So, so those voices are there and they do speak up, but there is an awful lot of people who do keep their heads down. And I suspect we'll say a bit more and talk a bit more about that a little later. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Richard. I mean, I just wondered, I mean, if you could tell us a little bit about your own interest in the Middle East and uh, how, how it came about. I mean, before you became an MP, had you travelled to Israel, Palestine? Um, you know, what were your connections? What, 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 what made this one of the great issues that you fought for in Parliament and continue to fight for today? I'd, I'd had an interest in the Middle East for many, many years, back to when I was a student. And even though I was able, never able to visit Israel and Palestine before I was elected to Parliament in the early 90s, I did actually manage to get to Lebanon in the mid-1970s when I was a student. That was at the height of the Lebanese Civil War. And that was when I visited my first Palestinian refugee camp I talked to my first Palestinians directly, and that experience never, never leaves you. It becomes a life sentence, um, you know, in many ways, because once you see and you learn, um, then 
you know, you you just can't ignore that going going forward. And of course, back in mid nineteen seventies, I was talking to people, many of whom themselves were direct refugees from the Nakba, from the creation of Israel. That was only about thirty years before I met them. You know, so that's kind of the equivalent of the mm. 1990s to us today. People who'd been adults when Israel was created, made re refugees at that time, were living in Lebanon. So hearing their stories, hearing their testimonies was very, very powerful. And it did mean to me that it was something that I was going to have to work on going forward. Yeah, I mean, I, it leads me on to the next question, really, which is, I know, for instance, the Council for a Arab British understanding it takes delegations to Israel and to Palestine. Uh, they're the all party group visits. There are, uh, you know, friends of Palestine, friends of Israel. But to an extent, do you think that there's a lot of there's a degree of control that goes into some of these visits increasingly? And I'm not just talking about people who are uh, stopped from going. I mean, I think, as you know, this, this week, a, a prominent Spanish member of the European Parliament was, uh, was <clears throat> traveling to um, the occupied territories. Do you think that um, increasingly uh, people are being, you know, their, their, their ability to, to, to see what you might have seen is, is more restricted? It is, without question, more difficult to get there now. As you say, there was a Spanish parliamentarian refused entry by Israel just this week. And there have been some other very worrying examples of parliamentarians, particularly European parliamentarians, being stopped from visiting in recent months. And that's as far as the Israel and the West Bank is concerned. As far as Gaza is concerned, the last time any UK parliamentarians were allowed in there through Israel, through the Eretz crossing, was 2009. I know I was on that delegation. So Israel has stopped visits to Gaza through its territory. So it is <clears throat> more difficult, but it's not impossible for most people. And it is there is really no substitute for seeing for yourself what's going on. That's why in the Britain-Palestine group that I chaired, in coordination with the Council for Our British Understanding, groups like Medical Aid for Palestinians and so on, we put such a lot of store by getting parliamentarians out there to see for themselves, because you can, you can read up so much about it, you can hear what other people say. But when you, you go and see what life, the reality of life is like for Palestinians living under occupation, not only do you get that very direct understanding, but it does convince most people that it's something that they have a responsibility to speak out about when they get back to the UK. <clears throat> now, that was incredibly valuable to the delegations that I went on. And we always, always put a great deal of store by talking to Palestinians in their communities, seeing what was going on. For example, at the moment, a really important parliamentary delegation went out just last week, visited Masafa Yatta, where mm -hmm. there is about a thousand Palestinians face eviction from their homes by Israel, flagrant violation of international law. Going and seeing their conditions for themselves is important to parliamentarians, but it's really, really important to Palestinians living there as well, because they know they're not alone. They know that people are noticing in the outside world and there are people to speak up for them. Now, as you say, there are <clears throat> visits that go out organised by through the government of Israel as well, and Friends of Israel, so-called groups like Labour Friends of Israel and Conservative Friends of Israel very often do those. Um, do they see what I would like them to see? I'm sceptical about that. I mean, they'll always say that they see both sides of the argument. And, you know, that's normally true to the extent that, as well as being hosted in the Israeli parliament with Israeli government officials and so on, they will normally travel across to Ramallah, have a meeting with somebody from the Palestinian Authority or other Palestinian officials. And it's good they do that. But that's not the same. Having meetings in Ramallah is not the same as seeing what it's like to live as a Palestinian under occupation. It's not the same <clears throat> as walking through a checkpoint with Palestinians, mm -hmm. witnessing the humiliation that goes on daily by the Israeli military at checkpoints. And I think it's really important for parliamentarians to do that, to get that understanding, whether they consider themselves to be friends of Palestine or friends of Israel.
And just following up from that, I mean, if if it is the case that um, uh, when it comes to Gaza, um, 2009 was the last time a group of parliamentarians, including yourself, uh, got there, is it possible to, for parliamentarians or others, other observers to get to Gaza from Egypt? Or is this really, as people say, an open air prison camp which can't be visited? Um, it is without doubt an open air prison camp. I mean, it's subject to the most grinding of blockades. Um, <clears throat> that means that levels of poverty, of unemployment, of deprivation in Gaza are skyrocketed. It means that <clears throat> they are short of basic necessities, medical supplies, and so on. So it is really an open air prison. There's no question about that. <clears throat> is it still sometimes possible to get in? through Egypt. Yes, it is. <clears throat> Theoretically, the Rafa crossing between Egypt and Gaza is closed a lot of the time. So, so easy access is not there through that crossing. Mm. But it is normally possible to get across. The problem with doing that is to get to Gaza via Egypt, you've got to travel across Sinai, which could be a five or six hour journey. Sinai itself is very dangerous, particularly northern Sinai, is very dangerous these days. There's um, quite a big Islamist, Daesh, Islamic State and other militant Islamic group presence there. So it can be quite dangerous to do that. And, you know, <clears throat> where it should be possible to just get down from you know, very, very easily from Tel Aviv to the Eretz crossing from Israel, that you should be maximum half an hour, three quarters of an hour journey mm. to the entrance to Gaza. It really is appalling that Israel is stopping people doing that. Yeah, and I, 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 going back to the my, my the first question, which I I, I, I didn't really want to sound uh, sort of, uh, I didn't really want to sound as though I, I, I didn't <laughs> the word voices for, for Palestine, um, and for peace in the British Parliament, because there clearly are. And you told us who some of those figures are. Many of them, you know, we've we've spoken to. <clears throat> I suppose the question the question is about all party groups, because I think a lot, some people watching will be interested to know. You know, how, how is it possible to bring together, for instance, political uh, enemies or adversaries? You know, Labour, Conservative, Nationalist, Green, or what have you, um, and. Once you, if you manage to do that, and you have a, a fairly effective all-party group, which becomes a lobby, you know how seriously are these all-party groups taken by government? So, so the first part of the question is how, how does it come together, and how do you actually work to get a common agenda? And on top of that, how influential are all-party groups? Would you say? Well, contrary to what a lot of people think, all party groups are not official committees of parliament. They don't have any official standing. <clears throat> with government or the parliamentary process. They're voluntary associations of MPs who share a common interest, <clears throat> excuse me, in a particular subject or a particular cause. Um, so it's a way of them networking together, networking with others involved in that cause, so that in relation to the Palestine group, for example, we did a lot of work always with the Council for Our British Understanding, with a number of humanitarian organisations working on Israel and Palestine, medical aid for Palestinians being an example on that. And by organising together, having a presence at things like Foreign Office Question Time, Prime Minister's Question Time, seeking debates in Parliament, you can begin to have an impact. And I think the one I would single out for the Britain-Palestine group <coughs> that really was an impact was by working together across party we were able in the in october of 2014 to get through the british house of commons a resolution calling on the government to recognize the state of palestine now that mm. was pretty unprecedented um government has never acted on that resolution i would hope that an incoming government uh, as a labor party member as, as you are mark I hope that be a labor government but i very much have a incoming Labour government will stick to its current manifesto commitment to immediately recognise the state of Palestine. That hasn't happened so far with the current government, but it had a big impact internationally that a major parliament like the UK parliament had voted to recognise the state of Palestine and it helped stimulate similar moves in other European countries. I wonder if I could move on um, to the, uh, the Balfour project which you're involved in because um, to my mind, it's very interesting that, uh, uh, you know, 
Britain has a particular historic has had a particular historic role in Palestine, and many might argue it has a particular historic responsibility, and it hasn't really met uh, its uh, its responsibilities in in many many ways. And that the Balfour Project represents a kind of understanding of that, and, and an, an attempt to also educate people uh, in, in in the way of what happened and Britain's role and what Britain should be doing and what you were just saying about the diplomatic recognition of Palestine would I guess be one of the um, one of the, uh, the issues that the Balfour project uh, are supporting but what can you tell me a, a bit more because there, obviously there are lots of organizations out there um, campaigning for the rights of Palestinians uh, what's different about the Balfour project and, and why should we be interested in it well you've hit our core mission on the head there Mark um, its core mission is to recognise Britain's historic role in Palestine and the ongoing responsibility that gives us to this day. <clears throat> Britain was the mandate power in Palestine from the end of the First World War right the way through to 1948. <clears throat> um, in 1917, Britain was responsible for the Balfour Declaration that first voiced UK government support for the creation of a Jewish national home in Palestine, with the caveat that nothing should be done to prejudice the rights of non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Um, the legacy of that Balfour Declaration is not well known in the UK. It's important it is much better known. And the other thing is that Britain, as the mandate power, um, did have the mandate power, the word mandate, is actually accurate because the responsibility of Britain as a mandate power, it was described as having a sacred trust to prepare Palestine and Palestinians for independence. That never happened. And down the line, you'd found that throughout the 20s and 30s, quite brutal repression of Palestinian Arab nationalism. And at the end of the day, when Britain pulled out of mandate Palestine in 1948, the creation of the State of Israel, um, which not only was a great achievement for the State of Israel and for the Zionist movement, but it also led to the dispossession of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who became refugees. And we are living with the legacy of that to this day. So we think it's important that there is an understanding in Britain of our role in what happened there not simply as an academic exercise, because that does leave us with a responsibility now to ensure that, that we do everything we can to achieve peace with justice. And when I say peace with justice, I mean both for Jews and for Arabs. I mean both for Israelis and for Palestinians equally. And equal rights for all communities in that part of the world is absolutely central to what the Balfour Project does. The other thing I would say about the Balfour Project is this. There is sometimes a tendency, I think, amongst those of us that work on Palestine and who are fervent supporters of Palestinian rights to spend a lot of our time talking to each other, mm. to, you know, without doubt, mm -hmm. re-motivate ourselves, without doubt, reinforce our collective anger at the enormity of what's happening mm -hmm. there and the injustice of what's happening there. But ultimately, that's not enough. And what Balfour, the Balfour Project is focused on is not particularly talking it with, with those of us who already agree, but to reach out, to educate where we can, to change minds where we can, and to contribute to the changes of policy so that Britain can play a far more active role in promoting peace with justice inside Israel and Palestine and to achieve the kind of equality that we want to see. And within that, recognition of the state of Palestine alongside Israel, an absolutely core objective of ours. Thank you, Richard. Now, we've got a question. This is from Cara, and she's, uh, she says, hello from the west coast of Ireland. Um, Hi, Cara. Cara is, uh, she, uh, she just leapt ahead. Here we are. Um, and she says, Cara, how, how can you discuss Palestinian rights when the language is policed, e.g., anti-Zionism is now legally uh, described as anti-Semitism, even though that negates Palestinian history? Um, <clears throat> I think it is true that there is a chilling effect these days of um, 
there are those, particularly those quite close to the Israeli government and lobby groups associated with the Israeli government that do try to equate any work for Palestinian rights, any criticism of the state of Israel with anti-Semitism, and in particular to draw an easy equation between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Um, now, I, I don't, I mean, it's not the case, Kara, that it's illegal to um, oppose Zionism, um, but, you know, that there is no doubt a chilling effect on the language. I mean, in relation to Zionism, I have to say, um, one of the problems, I think, of talking about Zionism is there's no agreed definition of what it means. You know, to some, it's historically the movement that worked for a Jewish national home in Palestine. To others, it is those people who supported that movement and the specific result of that movement in terms of the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. To others, it is just the principle of Jewish self-determination. And to another group of people, it's basically support for anything and everything the State of Israel does, however egregious. So I think, you know, it's very difficult to say, are you pro or anti-Zionist? Because my first question is, what do you mean by that? <laughs> but I think, you know, there is this problem that, um, you know, particularly those around the government of the State of Israel, it's quite a deliberate policy there to equate support for Palestinian rights and criticism of the State of Israel with anti-Semitism. And that's something that's got to be absolutely stood up against, um, not only because it's wrong and and it, it's uh, an insult to the people of Palestine and the people of Israel, but also I think it trivializes anti-Semitism, you know, which is a scourge, which is a threat that exists, sadly, even in um, British political parties, including my own, the Labour Party, you know, which has got a long history of anti-racism, where anti-racism is absolutely the core of our of our being. But has anti-Semitism existed in the Labour Party for some time? Yes, sadly, it has. Um, I think what's important is that we address that by identifying what the roots are, addressing those roots. I think the problem often is that what happens in practice is rather than addressing the issue and addressing the roots, what happens is that people try to avoid accusations of anti-Semitism um, from groups and organisations who themselves conflate anti-Semitism, not just with anti-Zionism, but with criticism of the state of Israel. And that's something that we've absolutely got to reject. Actually, as you're saying that, Richard, I'm 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 reminded that um, recently we had as one of our guests Kenneth Stern, who, as you know, is the architect of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, and he he told us that he was deeply concerned that the definition was being used to stifle criticism of Israel and support for Palestinian rights. So, you know, that's that's from the guy who 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 who, who has effectively been. Uh, put together the definition but listen I wonder if I could just take one more question from and please do send them in let us know who you are and where you're from and we'll uh, try and get in as many as we can whilst Richard is with us uh, Malia in London asks and says uh, hi Richard thank you for your work on Palestine many people in the UK Palestine solidarity movement today have become increasingly frustrated with what they see as the increasing gap between realities on the ground in Palestine and what feels like very out of touch and limited debates about the issue in Parliament. For example, people still stick to the two-state solution, despite the fact that Israel has clearly killed it through the settlements. Uh, so isn't it time um, for the stalemate to be broken uh, and for, the, for people to start talking about a rights-based approach in a single democratic uh, decolonized state? I don't think it's it's actually an either or there. I mean, first of all, I think Malia is it that uh, hi Malia. I, Malia, I think yeah. it, it's right that often debates in Parliament don't adequately reflect the realities on the ground, which is why we play so much store by getting out there, getting parliamentarians to see for themselves, so they can talk with a degree of personal knowledge of the situation on the ground. I mean, it's also absolutely true that through its constant building of settlements, 
the um, Bantustanization, if you like, mm -hmm. of the West Bank. Israel is killing the two-state two solution. To some would say that it's already dead as a result of Israel's actions. Ultimately, whether or not um, the Palestinians themselves want to argue <clears throat> for one state with equal rights for all or to, to continue to argue for two states, uh, a, a Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel, that's ultimately something for the parties themselves to sort out and to agree. I don't think it's up to me to lecture them about that. However, what you say about a rights-based approach is absolutely correct. Palestinians have got rights. Those rights need to be upheld and acknowledged as no less, no fewer than the rights of Israelis and the right to self-determination, the right to a state of their own, if that's you know what the way they wish to exercise that right, is no less precious than the right of Israelis to a state of their own. And that's why recognition and British support for recognition of the state of Palestine is so, so important. It's logically impossible, it seems to me, to talk about a two-state solution whilst only recognising one of those states. But also the way sometimes the two-state solution is promoted in parliamentary and other governmental debates, and certainly by some of the um, lobby groups supporting Israel or the state of Israel, the government of Israel, they say, well, if a Palestinian state has got to come about, is going to come about, it should be the result of negotiations. Well, they would absolutely reject the concept that somehow recognition of the state of Israel should be as a result of negotiation. They would say with some force that that is a question of the rights of Israelis. Well, if Israelis have those rights, and I believe they have, Palestinians have got no fewer rights. And I think Douglas Alexander, when he was the Labour Shadow Foreign Secretary in 2014, when we won that historic vote in the House of Commons, put it very, very well. He said that recognition of Palestine is not a gift to be given, but a right to be realised. And I think that puts it very, very appositely. Mm. You see, Richard, I mean, it's we're looking at an Israeli government that is universally acknowledged as as the most extreme it's ever had. I mean, there are people serving the tanks. We know we've, we've talked about them before. Uh, who have got criminal records, uh, one who is would be quite happily described himself as a homophobic fascist. I mean, the most extraordinary things are happening. And at the same time, we're seeing huge demonstrations in Israel, of course, uh, again, uh, against the Netanyahu government and its, uh, and its threat to the legal uh, establishment there and legal rights of people uh, in uh, Israel. Um, and yet it still seems to be business as usual. Uh, and not just from the British government, but from the European Union, uh, from the United States. I mean, Secretary of State Blinken was uh, over there uh, just a week or so ago. Um, there, of course, is that we, we know that the, the resolution that was going to be voted on, um, I believe tomorrow, uh, has been in the General Assembly, in the Security Council, has been substantially watered down. So it, it does appear that... Um, there, there, and also on top of that, as you know, Richard, the, 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 there's been substantial increase in Israeli military incursions into occupied territories. The death tally has grown substantially. It, or it is actually getting so much worse, and yet it does still seem to be business as usual. And so you can see why a lot of people are saying, well, what will it take for Secretary of State Blinken to say, you've got to stop doing X, Y, and Z, or we'll turn the money tap off. No, I think that's absolutely right. And it absolutely should not be business as usual. And that isn't because the oppression of the Palestinians started with the current extremist Israeli Netanyahu government. And your description of that has been absolutely right. I mean, it's populated by some incredibly unsavory characters, including people who themselves, as you say, refer to themselves as fascist homophobes. Um, but, you know, last year, 2022, was the worst year for the deaths of Palestinians in the West Bank. And actually, the Netanyahu government was not in power then. It was the previous government under Bennett and Lapid. So the increasing tightening of occupation, the worsening of the situation of Palestinians in the West Bank, 
didn't start with Netanyahu. And I do think we need to get that mm -hmm. perspective in place. That said, what the current Israeli government is announcing just does take things to a new level. Netanyahu published a program for government where he said quite openly that he sees the entire land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea as the land of Israel, over which Jews have, in his words, an exclusive and unquestionable right. Um, now, you know, that is a big, big change and complete, completely jettisons and completely destroys any possibility, if they stick to that, of either a two-state solution or indeed a one-state solution with equal rights. I mean, if that is his view, that that entire land is one which is controlled entirely where only Israeli Jews have rights, you are talking about an apartheid system there, no question about that. So the international community does have to respond. You know, I mean, good, I guess, that at least something is being said now about the uh, Israeli government's um, decision to legalise legalizing quotes because they're still illegal under international law, a, a range of their illegal settlements. Um, it's good that the international community, including Britain, including the United States, have spoken out about that. But frankly, words are not enough. There needs to be accountability and there needs to be action. And, you know, it's interesting that on the few occasions in the past where the United States has moved, then Israel has responded. Back in the first Gulf War, part of the deal, if you like, for support from Arab states like Syria for the um, American and international action against Iraq at that time was that something would be done on Palestine to resolve the Israel-Palestine conflict. Now, in fact, at that time, there was... Um, I mean, after that, there was the proposal of what became the Madrid Conf Conf um, the Madrid Conference. Um, and the then Israeli Prime Minister, Shamir, said he wasn't going to cooperate. And the response from the USA under George Bush Sr. was basically, well, if you're not going to cooperate, you won't be wanting the credits that we're going to give you. And it was, you know, interesting that that did move Israeli policy and they ended up at that Madrid conference. The conference didn't achieve what it needed to achieve, but it does show that international mm. pressure works. And it's why all of us in the UK need to be lobbying for that as strongly as we can and why we really have got a right to expect more of the British government than saying all the right things about international law, but not acting upon them. Thank you, Richard. Look, if I may, I'll take... Um... I'll take two or three more questions uh, that are being sent in. Um, Richard in Doncaster asks, um, why does the Labour Party, which claims to be anti-racist, have a Labour Friends of Israel group when it is now pretty incontrovertible that Israel is practising the crime of apartheid, uh, i.e. an insidious form of institutionalised racism? Isn't this a contradiction? Well, you know, I... <clears throat> I know a lot of people in the Jewish community and beyond that would absolutely consider themselves to be friends of Israel, but they they understand that friends, true friends, have got to be able to criticise. True friends have got to have the right to tell home truths when they're necessary. And those people would very bravely speak out to say that if Israel is going to have a secure future, it cannot be at the expense of Palestinians. The Palestinians have got equal rights and that the occupation has got to end. And there are Jewish groups in the UK, one of which is Yakad, who are very bravely speaking out for that. But if you ask them, are they friends of Israel? They would say, absolutely, they are. And what saddens me is that some of the official friends of Israel groups, like Labour Friends of Israel and Conservative Friends of Israel, spend a huge amount of their time downplaying um, um, criticism of Israel um, or opposing the practical realisation of Palestinian rights. You know, one of the examples that we talked about recognition, they have been opposing recognition of the state of Palestine. Now, they would say, if they were here today, well, they actually see, you know, 
they support Palestinian rights as well as Israeli rights. In fact, Labour Friends of Israel, one of their strap lines is for Israel, for Palestine, for peace. Well, if that's what they believe, then I think they need to look to their priorities because I do not see how that is compatible with, as I say, soft peddling on criticism of Israel or rejecting things like um, the recognition of the state of Palestine. And my appeal to them would be if they want to be even handed when they go on their visits to Israel and Palestine, just don't just go and meet Israeli government officials. Don't just go and meet Palestinian government officials. Go and see what life is like. There was a Labour Friends of Israel delegation to Israel just a few weeks ago. One of the things they did, as well as meeting officials, is they visited a kibbutz near the Gaza border um, to see what it was like to live under the threat of rockets for ordinary civilians to live under the threat of rockets from Gaza. Now, I think they were absolutely right to do that. It's important that parliamentarians know the real fear that Israeli civilians face and feel, particularly in those communities near the Gaza border. But my question is, why didn't they also go into Gaza to witness what it's like to be part of a 15-year blockade, to live under blockade, and to live under the constant threat of Israeli airstrikes? You know, so if they really want to be even handed, those Friends of Israel groups, it seems to me, need to put their money where their mouth is and they need to act on it and they need to demonstrate their support for Palestinian rights in practice. And those rights only mean if they are equal to Israelis, not second class. Mm, thank you. Uh, just another couple, um, briefly. Uh, Lila in London asks, <coughs> would parliamentarians find it helpful if Palestinians proposed a definition of anti-Palestinian racism uh, for endorsement? Or could this help elevate its importance and shine a light on the prevalence of this specific form of racism? And this, uh, Steve uh, from Leicester. Steve, this is this is a bit more of a sort of Labour Party question, but you'll, I'm sure you'll be able to answer it, Richard. Steve, how can Labour members best influence party policy, including through the policy forum? Is Labour Friends of Palestine and Middle East still an effective organisation? Um, <clears throat> well, let, let's take that last one first. Labour Friends of Palestine and the Middle East is still effective. Uh, we're going through a period of reorganisation at the moment. And we absolutely need to develop our organizational capacity. If you look at Labour Friends of Israel, for example, they're very, very well funded. They've got, you know, a full time paid staff. And you need to do have that kind of level of organizational capacity if you're going to be as effective as you can be in Parliament and beyond. Labour Friends of Palestine hasn't got that. We work entirely on the basis of volunteers. So that's something that we're trying to address, and it's really important that we do address. But um, the question about how Labour policy can be influenced, really, really good question, particularly this year, because this year is when the consultation is going on that will lead to the Labour manifesto being published ready for the next general election. It seems to me to be absolutely vital that we keep in the next manifesto the commitment that has been there in previous manifestos to immediate recognition of the state of Palestine by an incoming Labour government. That's absolutely to me the tip top priority. So if anybody watching this podcast is a member of the Labour Party, please do through your own constituents of the Labour Party, get a motion through or put a submission in to the National Policy Forum to call for adherence to continued recognition of the state of Palestine. There are other things that I would like to see in there as well, one of which is an insistence on the absolute primacy of international law in relation to Israel and Palestine. Britain is very good at calling for our international law to be held, upheld in other situations, rightly, most particularly at the moment, I guess, in relation to Ukraine. But it's very, very weak in terms of existing on that in practice when it comes to Israel and Palestine. So I would like to see Labour commit itself absolutely four squarely to uphold international law as the cornerstone of any um, sustainable peace settlement in Israel and Palestine. And the third thing is, I think there is a consultation going on at the moment about Labour's trade policy. I don't think any trade policy in the UK or by the UK should collude with illegality. Now, settlements, Israeli settlements 
in the occupied territory are no question. They are illegal. Whether Netanyahu or any other Israeli minister decides to declare them legal, they're not. International law is crystal clear. You cannot establish colonies on someone else's land. That is contrary to the Geneva Convention very, very clearly. Therefore, it seems to me that no UK firm should collude in that illegality and therefore we should ban trade with settlements. Thank you, Richard. And actually, there's another question. That was Leila's question, which, if you recall, was um, the uh, idea of a, of, a, of a definition of anti-Palestinian racism. Do you think that's uh, something worth pursuing? Um, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure whether or not <clears throat> codifying a definition um, is feasible. I and mean, it's an interesting an interesting suggestion and certainly something that's worth looking at. But I do think we need to be um, conscious of and alert to the fact that anti-Palestinian racism does exist. You know, if you take the view that Israelis have rights, you know, but Palestinians only have privileges, and I'd say recognition is one example of that, but there's a whole range of others you know, the discriminatory, the fact that Palestinians in the West Bank live under Israeli military law, Israeli settlers in the West Bank live under Israeli civil law, discrimination at the core of the treatment of Palestinians. Inside Israel itself, Palestinians live as second-class citizens. The nation-state law that was passed by Israel just a few years ago specified that only Jews have got national rights inside the state of Israel not the non-Jewish minority, which you know do con constitute over 20% of the population now. Now, if you're saying that one set of people has got rights by reason of their religion and, or their ethnicity, greater rights than another set of people, then there is a description for how you regard that other set of people. Mm. Now, you mm. could call it overt racism, you could call it unconscious bias, but whatever you call it, it's a problem, it needs to be addressed. And those kinds of attitudes need to be addressed in the UK. So, Richard, I, I wondered if we could, um, in, in the last sort of uh, 10, 15 minutes, look at one or two with one or two other issues. You kind of touched on it briefly when you talked about international law um, and Ukraine, for instance, uh, the occupation of parts of Ukraine, clearly uh, uh, against international law. The General Assembly seems to be likely to vote very, very clearly again tomorrow to condemn it and call for Russia to withdraw from the occupied territories in Ukraine. But what we do hear from a lot of people is that, you know, there seems to be a lack of consistency. For instance, the United States under President Trump accepted Morocco's illegal occupation of Western Sahara. Um, the, the, the West has moved amazingly quickly over Ukraine and engaging the International Criminal Court, as you know, and yet, as you just mentioned there, it's an entirely different situation uh, with the occupied territories um, uh, in Israel-Palestine. And I suppose it, December last year, actually, it was the U UN General Assembly, as you know, asked the International Court of Justice to give an opinion on the legal consequences of Israel's occupation of the Palestinian of the territories. And it did so by 87 votes to 20, 26, including 53 abstentions. Britain voted with the United States against that resolution. So you can see why an awful lot of people around the world in the global south, I, you could argue, think, well, it's all a bit too, it's all a bit two-faced, isn't it? We're expected to condemn Russia for what it's done, but at the same time, they're not really prepared to do anything about this occupation in Palestine. Yeah, I mean, outrageous double standards by the British government, by the United States of America and the others that voted <clears throat> against that resolution. And I think you're right, you know, that the awareness of those double standards does have an impact in the global south. And I think it's one of the factors, not the only factor, but one of the factors that makes them deeply sceptical about the West's actions and wholehearted support for Ukraine in the face of the Russian aggression there. Now, I don't think we're wrong in what we're doing in Ukraine. I think it's absolutely right to stand up against occupation, absolutely right to stand up against aggression, and absolutely right to stand up against illegal annexation. And that's what's going on in Ukraine. 
But if it's right to do that there, it's also right to stand up against occupation and illegal annexation in Israel and Palestine as well. Either we're for upholding international law or we're not. I don't think you can adopt a pick and mix approach there. Um, <clears throat> now, that's not to say that the solution, either I'm arguing or indeed any of us, I think, are arguing that there is somehow a military solution in Israel and Palestine. There isn't. Um, but um, the but you know part of the reason around that as well is that if it would be wrong and people would feel it would be wrong to arm Palestinian resistance inside the West Bank or in, indeed in Gaza, then one has to question why there is continues to be an arms trade with Israel and a great deal of military cooperation there. If actually we are pro-peace and pro-international law, surely we need to bring a conf that conflict to an end and do everything we can to do that. And having a military alliance with the body that is actually, or the country that's doing the occupation, doing the annexation, seems to me to be entirely wrong. And if we do reject any kind of military solution there, as I think we absolutely must, we have to say, well, how actually do you achieve change? And that's where the legal route of accountability comes into play. And that's entirely what that resolution that you referred to, Mark, in the UN General Assembly was all about. Israel has been in occupation of the West Bank and legally in occupation of Gaza, despite the fact they withdrew their settlements. They still have got the status of an occupying power there for over 55 years. Now, under international law, occupations are meant to be temporary. They're not meant to be permanent. Mm. And so it seems to me to be entirely valid that to actually look on, in international law terms what the status of that occupation should be and what accountability there should be if it is found to be contrary to international law. So how do you do that? Well, it, you know, the recognised body that was set up to give an opinion on international law is the International Court of Justice. Why on earth is it felt to be wrong to ask them for an opinion on something that's a clear matter of international law? I mean, there's also an amazing amount of double think that goes on from the British government here as well. Because when they were asked quite recently whether they agreed with the judgment of the Israeli human rights organization, Betzalem, with Human Rights Watch, with Amnesty International, that Israel is guilty of the crime of apartheid in its treatment of the Palestinians. What the UK government said is it's not a matter for us to talk about that. Whether a crime has been committed is a matter for judicial decision, not governmental decision. Well, if they take that view, why then did the British government vote against seeking a judicial opinion on the occupation? And why does it oppose the reference of Israel and indeed of Palestinian arms group, armed groups to the International Criminal Court to examine very substantial, substantial allegation that war crimes have been committed in that part of the world? I say, Either international law, you uphold it or you don't. And I believe we should. And at the moment, there are absolutely appalling double standards being displayed by our government, by the United States and indeed a number of others. Um, I, I wonder in the last sort of uh, five, five, ten minutes, which I'd ask you another couple of questions. One would be, I, I suppose, you're being a long standing friend of the Palestinians. Do, I mean, does that also mean that you can speak quite candidly? to the Palestinian leadership, for instance. Um, and, and do you think it's also part of your mission, for instance, to say to them, well, look, we are putting all sorts of pressure on our government in Britain to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, we're speaking out against uh, what Israel is doing. But, you know, you have also got to look at what you can do yourselves. And you're not doing yourselves any great favours, for instance, by stopping having elections. Do you, do you feel that that's something that you can say to the leadership of FATA? Um, is that something, do you have, are you able to have any com any communications whatsoever with Hamas? And I suppose another concomitant question might be, do you think there's any possibility um, that uh, these divisions between Hamas and FATA can be resolved and there can be a common elected uh, government that represents all Palestinians? 
I, I not only think it's legitimate for us to say that, I think it's vital that we do say that. And, you know, obviously what I was saying earlier on is if groups call themselves friends of Israel, mm. then it's their responsibility to tell Israel some home truths about its behaviour. As a friend of Palestine, I think it's also my responsibility to um, speak truth to power as far as the Palestinians are concerned as well. Um, Mahmoud Abbas was elected president in mm. 2005. Hamas was elected as the majority in the Palestinian parliament one year later in 2006. There have been no Palestinian national, by national I mean West Bank and Gaza, elections since then. And that is appalling. It's undemocratic and it's appalling. Now, why haven't those elections taken place? Partly, that is the responsibility of Israel. Um, they have basically said when the elections were scheduled a year or two back that they wouldn't allow Palestinians in East Jerusalem to vote, um, you know, which is egregious, really. East Jerusalem is occupied territory. It's part of the West Bank. They should have... Palestinians living in East Jerusalem should have the same right to vote as Palestinians living in Ramallah or Palestinians living in Gaza or Palestinians living in Bethlehem. So Israel bears some responsibility through getting in the way of Palestinian democracy. But that, frankly, does not let um, the Palestinian Authority or Mahmoud Abbas himself off the hook. They should be pushing far more for elections and making them happen in practice. What you're seeing, sadly, is an increasing authoritarianism amongst the ruling um, figures within mm -hmm. um, the Palestinian Authority, increasing intolerance and suppression of dissent, both in Ramallah through the Fatah-dominated Palestinian Authority, but also in Gaza through Hamas rule. Both Hamas and Fatah are guilty of their authoritarianism, are guilty of suppression of dissent, dissent and both of them both of those things have got to end and friends of palestine need to say that very very clearly in my view the fact that those things are going on the fact that um palestine does has not had or palestinians have not had the right to a democratic vote for so long at the same time as the occupation has continued in many ways got worse has meant that there are generations that are growing up in Palestine now that have never known anything different. Generations of young people who frankly see no mm. hope and have got very little faith in their leaders. It's little surprising then that they themselves are now not only feel that their leaders have got very little credibility, but are looking to what they can do to change their lives. And you know that can sometimes mean nonviolent resistance I think the fact you're increasingly seeing new armed groups developing in parts of the West Bank, in Janine, in Nablus and so on, um, is part of that feeling of hopelessness, that feeling that young people in Palestine have frankly got nothing to lose. I think, you know, that is part of that. And those armed groups being developed, you know, springing up, some of them are linked to existing armed groups where they're affiliated with Fatah, or with Hamas, or with Palestinian Islamic Jihad, but also they're increasingly having an identity that is beyond those things. So, you know, that is a consequence of the impact of occupation, the fact that occupation is continuing. It's a consequence of Israel's policy towards Palestine, but it's also a consequence of the failure of Palestine's leaders themselves to give their people a say in their future. So going forward onto your second question there, Mark, about is there potential for you know a greater unity between Fatah and Hamas? Well, there have been various rounds of negotiations over the you know recent years, a number of false dawns. Will they be able to settle their differences and coexist in Palestinian government? I don't know. Again, I think you know there's a lesson for the you know, the UK here in the international community, because often our approach to that has made that situation worse, not better. The fact that the division between Hamas and Fatah between Gaza and the West Bank has persisted so long, it's obviously very bad for Palestinians, but it's actually also very bad for the prospects for peace. And I think, you know, we've made that worse by our 
refusal, for example, to even engage with Hamas. That's not to say that Hamas should be recognized. Um, you know, Palis the Palestinian president, the recognized Palestinian president, you know, should continue to be um, Mahmoud Abbas. He was the one that was elected, even though that he, you know, absolutely should put himself up for re-election or move over to somebody else to take over. But, you know, so it's not a question about who is recognized to speak on behalf mm -hmm. of the Palestinians, but to refuse to engage with, you know, something that is a fact of life in Palestinian politics like Hamas, in my view, is very, very short-sighted. And it's interesting that people who have experience of things like the Northern Ireland peace process are increasingly saying that as well, including, interestingly, Tony Blair himself. He was one of the architects of the no-contact policy with Hamas. And even he has been saying, looking back, that was probably a mistake. So I hope that they will be able to resolve their differences better than they have so far. I hope that will lead to new elections so that the Palestinian people can have a say. But I say, I think, you know, for the future for Palestine, we need to be listening and Palestinian leaders need to be listening to the new generations of Palestinians, the young people who have been growing up, who do not define their hopes and aspirations simply by being a member or a supporter of Hamas or a member or supporter of Fatah. I get the impression that they want something new, they want something different. Um, and I hope that Palestinian political party, whether it be Fatah, whether it be Hamas, whether it be new political parties yet to emerge, need to recognise that so that Palestinians themselves mm -hmm. have got democratic rights. I say that's important not only for democracy, but I think it's important for the prospects for mm. peace and a peace that can guarantee the equal rights for both Israelis and Palestinians, because too many innocent Palestinian lives have been lost, too many innocent Israeli lives have been lost, and we've all got a responsibility to try to bring that to an end. That means being absolutely firm that the occupation's got to end. It means that being absolutely firm that the state of Palestine has got to be recognised and it means being absolutely firm in saying to the Palestinians themselves that they need to organise elections. Well, finally, Richard, because we, we, sadly we've run out of time, and thank you also to everybody who sent in questions. Sorry we couldn't get everybody, but I just wanted to, you know, the, in, 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 in our conversation uh, today, it, it, there is a sort of, a, it's, you get the impression that, that it's often darkest before the dawn, and these are particularly, particularly dark times. Um, and yet out there, there is a feeling amongst a lot of people that uh, essentially not much is changing when it comes to Western attitudes, to the Western government attitudes towards uh, Israel uh, and its business as usual, as we've talked about. And I suppose I was just wondering, do you think in, you know, in five to ten years time, uh, it will be as difficult to find somebody uh, who had been active in, pol in politics or whatever, who was... Uh, not a critic of Israel and in favour of Palestinian rights, in much the same way that you today you can't find anybody who ever defended South Africa during apartheid. Or actually, if you can find many any people who who thought that the Iraq War was a very good thing um, twenty odd years ago, do you think that you know people will have a less, the lessons will have been learned and people will have they would it would have all changed? Do you think? we're going to be looking at a different scenario. Who knows? I mean, despite the debilitating caution of UK political parties, Western political parties generally, that we've talked about quite a lot today, I think public opinion is very, very different. I think there is a much greater understanding and sympathy in public amongst the British people for what the Palestinians are going through, aided by the fact they're able to see what's going on through social media and so on. Mm. So, you know, so I think there's a message for UK political parties there that they need to be bolder in standing up for the rights of Palestinians and indeed, I'd say, the rights of Israelis as well from the principle of equality. Um, they need to jettison some of the caution and, you know, stand by, put their money, as I say, where their mouth is in terms of upholding international law, upholding human rights and equality of rights for Israelis and Palestinians. Looking to the future, I don't know. Will they? everybody look back and say, oh, well, I was a critic of the Israeli government back in 2023? Maybe they will. 
But I think the question that, you know, a politician now needs to answer is if they are asked that question in years to come, will they not only say, well, they didn't really approve of what the Israeli government was doing, they'll also be able to answer the question, what on earth did they do about it at the time? And, you know, frankly, if we say all the right things and we do nothing, we don't do right by the people of Palestine. And I would argue we don't do right by the people of Israel either. Well, thank you, Richard. And, and Cara says, thank you very much, Richard, for this uh, interesting and uh, informative discussion, which it has been. So thank you to all of you who've uh, sent questions in. Sorry we couldn't get all of you. Uh, of course, please join us next time. Thank you to our very special guest, uh, Richard Burden. Richard, thanks for your time. We'd love to have you on again. Uh, good I'd luck. Love to you. Thank you. Richard, we'll have you de definitely back again. So we'd, we're very grateful. And and I'll, the, I'd also just like to, to thank everybody in the Palestine Deep Dive team, Omar, Alex, uh, and David McQueen says thanks. Well, thank you to you all, but especially thank you to Richard Burden. All the best and see you soon. Thank bye -bye. you to you. Bye-bye.